Good morning, everybody. So let's let's turn to that. Just to the Zamkur class, and then I will skip to English. Uh, thank you for listening to a psychologist. Uh, there is a saying when I was a student of psychology, they said there is a anecdote about the unreturned love of psychology towards physics, because the first psychologists were actually physicists, and they were uh, forming our science, and then we went abroad. So uh, I will tell you something about the popular myths in psychology, and most of them actually appear uh, as a consequence of a bad scientific communication with the wider audience and with media, uh, especially in the 20th century. Uh, and just to mention that this is actually my second Connect project. The, the first Connect project was uh, 17 years ago, and it was about uh, post-traumatic syndrome in Yugoslavia. And th this one is much nicer, <laughs> at least towards the topic. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you've seen this movie. You know, it's yeah, Lucy. Yeah, yeah, Lucy. Yeah, yeah, 10%. 10% yeah. of yeah, the brain. Yeah. I hate that myth. <laughs> and this is, of course, one of the myths. And uh, how is she related to Popeye? Uh, yesterday, we, we talked about when we were kids, we were all <laughs> reading Popeye as Popeye. <laughs> we, we kind of get the feeling that this is true. Uh, so, uh, how is it related to Popeye? Uh, actually, I'd like to start this story uh, just not to appear that psychology is the only science with myths inside. Uh, one of the most popular myths outside psychology is uh, starting with this guy uh, more than 150 years ago uh, when he made an error with decimals. Uh, what he actually did, he, instead of writing three and a half grams, he uh, made an error and put in 35. He just forgot to put a decimal point. And what happened is that it still happens today that a lot of our uh, parents make us eat spinach because of that. Because uh, even today, uh, many, many people all over the world believe that the spinach is full of iron, uh, which actually has 10 times less than most people believe. <coughs> Actually, spinach is one of the plants which has the smallest amount of error of iron uh, among many other uh, groceries. And uh, what, what actually happened is some 60 or 70 years ago, error was noticed. And they say, okay, this is not, this is a bad calculation, it's just a mistake. But unfortunately, <coughs> Popeye appeared. And uh, this is something which actually spread the myth, actually spread the error. And 150 years later, we still cannot beat this myth. People still believe it, it, in it. And although, as a kid, when you look at the spinach, you say, ah, it, yucks, it's not too tasty. But the parents say, oh, eat it, Papa eats it, it's full of iron, it's good for you. Actually, the only true in that is that Papa eats it. There is no iron. I mean, there is, a, but it's in traces. Uh, it's an uh, error, but a lot of people all over the world believe it, and it's actually a spread error. Uh, and when we go back to psychology, there are a lot of myths in it. I will start with the most obvious ones, uh, which are uh, famous in a sense, but a lot of even psychology students believe in it. When I was a kid, I liked parapsychology, you know, extrasensory perception. It seems like uh, a mystery, a magic, and so on. Uh, it's sometimes called extrasensory perception. What does it mean? When you perceive something without your senses. Uh, just not to, to make you look that this is uh, something which people uh, believe in uh, countryside or uneducated people. Actually, in the 1972, the United States government spent $20 million on so-called Stargate project. They defined it the ability of remote observers to perceive military useful information remotely, on distance. This is actually parapsychological activity. This program no. is described in the famous movie The Man Who Stared at Goats. And if you haven't seen it, I warmly recommend it to you. Uh, it's a wonderful <coughs> movie. This project was funded until 1995. 
So they spent $20 million in searching for something looking like this. It's actually, let's say, scientific project, although it's not scientific. Uh, what did they find in 20 and something years? They found nothing. So are there any data showing that people can read minds or perceive something which is not available to them? No, it's actually nothing found. Uh, somewhere at the end, uh, there was an idea that these effects maybe are small and it's hard to detect them. Maybe there is some kind of a hidden ability in the human mind. And maybe it's just there is a lot of noise in regular perception. So we cannot actually uh, notice these effects. People cannot be aware of them. And somebody found a work of uh, Metzger. Metzger is a German psychologist from the 1930. He had this uh, effect which is called Gansfeld, like the homogeneous field. And they actually started believing that if you put people in this, maybe you'll clear this noise and maybe these effects will become visible. I will just shortly demonstrate to you what is Gansfeld. Because when I, when I describe it and I say Gansfeld, it even sounds more mysterious. Gansfeld is this. So just stare at this point in the middle and just keep staring. I'm not sure whether you in the back will see it, but <laughs> keep staring. <laughs> keep staring and after some 10 seconds, the cloud will begin disappearing. Yes. Just all this cloud around the dot just disappears in a certain moment. What actually happens here is that we have a brain cells which are called edge detectors. Their only function is to detect contours of objects. When you're staring at something, the sharp edges are actually contours. When this cell starts from here and going and doesn't find the contour, she signals to the brain, there is nothing here. There is no contours. <coughs> and then the brain says, okay, there is nothing here. Everything is white. As soon as you move or blink, it returns, and the cell starts looking again and it's again. Why is this Gansfeld effect was found by these guys searching for a parapsychological activity? They believe if you put people in this kind of a surrounding, the noise, what they believed was noise, from real senses, like from the eyes or so, will disappear, and maybe then this parapsychological effect will appear because they are kind of a uh, grounded by this. Uh, what actually these effects look like, you put, uh, you, you take a huge uh, uh, sphere and you put people inside it. It's totally white and you just put the head of the people and when you look at the white surrounding for a few moments then your cells mainly shut down. They, they, they don't see anything and it's, it's a weird effect. What happened in these uh, Studies is actually, uh, I don't know, does the, the older crowd recognize this guy or if he was only popular in Serbia? <laughs> this is, yeah, this is tra trauma from my childhood. Uh, somewhere at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, this guy appeared and he was in all uh, media. My mother bought this. This was a card sold by TV Review in, uh, in Serbia. And uh, he had this bioenergy and he quite kind of a curate. Actually, you could see that uh, this is what happens when something non-existent uh, is taken over by the uh, government and it sells you uh, to, to misguide you. Was he a member of you, party or? Uh, was he, he, was, he was kind of a, a Russian background or something. Yeah, right. it says you. He no, no, he was the man. <laughs> uh, no, 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 this is the man from here. Yeah, 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 but that's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, when, when Alan appeared, uh, you wasn't formed yet as a, as a party. But yeah, the government kind of, of course, he, he was in a state media, all of it, and they tried to sell it to us. What actually was found is, uh, again, nothing. Uh, these, uh, in the 1999, they did this meta-study. What's a meta-study? You take a lot of experiments from published papers, and you kind of uh, analyze the data from all of them, and they actually say that always effect size was at the chance level. 
So just like to think that uh, some some people believe in it. Uh, there was a government uh, funded the project about this with 20 and something years, and we can say for sure that parapsychology is not found. It doesn't exist, even in those things like extrasensory perception, which sound a bit more scientific than, than the parapsychology. You probably heard about this one. It's a hypnosis, psychology. Whoever hears about psychology, he thinks we hypnotize people on business. Uh, it's hard for me to say to you what is hypnosis. Uh, I finished psychology, did my PhD, and we mentioned it. Somebody mentioned it. But when I actually think of, I don't know even one psychologist who knows to hypnotize people. And now I know a few who went to some kind of a training, and I tell you how it looks like. What was the problem with hypnosis? Somewhere in the mid 20th century, there was a few, hundred and something years ago, there was this idea about uh, uh, hypnosis in treating the ill people and yeah. psychologically yeah. ill and so on. But in the mid 20th century, it became very popular in police investigations. Maybe we can help through hypnosis the victims to remember something. And uh, there, there was this guy in 2001, he was 21 years in prison. Uh, when DNA analysis was available, it turned out that he wasn't guilty. And he was charged only based on that that hypnotized victim recognized him. Although two witnesses identified him as innocent, police and the prosecutor believed the hypnotized victim because they believed that hypnosis is kind of a something uh, more uh, advanced or so on. And they actually charged not only him. So far, we know that in the United States, 100 people were innocently charged based on the hypnosis although they, they, they were innocent. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus says, that she's an investigator, that in 1980s, 84% of psychologists believed, which is a huge amount, almost all, that hypnosis can extract memory. Although, in fact, when you do experiments and research, hypnosis cannot improve memory. It can even change them because it's it's a weird you know it's, it's kind of a state when you're when you're swimming all day and you have two beers and you're going to bed and you know that feeling kind of ah uh, and this is hypnosis it's, it's kind of a state of mind when you're just uh, in that state you can remember anything even the things that didn't happen it turns out there, there were popular ideas like when you hypnotize people, they remember that they were abducted by the aliens. Everybody remembers that they were abducted by the aliens. Mm -hmm. Because you can remember whatever I tell you to remember. It's a kind of a s suggestion works there. Experiments show that in hypnosis, there are more errors and mistakes than accurate recollections. So there were a lot of serious consequences of this just because people believed it's something uh, strange, better, although real data showed the opposite. Not only that it cannot improve, it can actually uh, make memories uh, worse. Today it's used and it's only shown useful in treatment of pain and some habit disorders like smoking. So the only uh, procedure in which is used today as an effective treatment is when you want to quit smoking it's shown to have some effects. But it's never used as a separate technique. It's always used as a addition to some other techniques. And it's a kind of a, you know, the, the things that you know, like with the clock and so it just doesn't work like that. It's kind of a relaxation technique in which, in which makes you more suggestion prone and so on. So, parapsychology, now we are going to more uh, famous and less obvious myths. So, parapsychology, you probably believe, doesn't exist. Hypnosis, kind of, a, <laughs> it exists, but it's totally different, and their effects are much different than those that most of the people, even most psychologists, believe they have. 
suppression is one of the defense mechanism, which is actually came from one, one psychological theory. And it says that we suppress our experiences and memories uh, which have negative effects on us. It came from the theory of psychoanalysis, which is uh, probably most famous by Sigmund Freud. And uh, this is the only, uh, probably the most famous psychologist who is even not a psychologist, he's a medical doctor. And uh, when you ever say about psychology, people think about Sigmund Freud and his effects on some theories were huge, of course, and he had a lot of effect on development of psychotherapy. But one of the most famous uh, ideas of his is that we suppress negative emotions and stuff. But in fact, <coughs> the data, the real research data we have actually show the opposite. Uh, Alan Bentley is the guy who is one of the key figures in memory perceptions, in uh, memory psychology, psychology of memory. And he says that data show that, of course, our memory of negatively emotionally charged events is even better, which makes sense. And I will show you just one experiment on rats, of course, not on people. We have experiments on people too. Uh, but this is like when you put a rat in the maze, and you, he runs and learns how to go to the maze. And when you put an injection of adrenaline into the rat, adrenaline makes him kind of emotionally charged and so on, uh, he learns and memorizes much better. Why? Because this is one of the things what, what emotions do to our body and our mind. Emotions are signals for us that something is in, important. If emotion tells you that something is important, your mind will memorize it better. Why? If it's a pleasant emotion, your brain will want to repeat it. If it's a highly unpleasant, it will save you from avoiding it. It would be an awful evolutionary mistake is when everything is scary for you, your brain says, oh, just forget it. <laughs> we wouldn't survive uh, as a species. Just remember how uh, when you like a taste a bad food and you, you get sick of, about it, you, you won't eat that food for like 10 or 15 years maybe. But when I was a kid, I, my, my uncle bought me a peanuts. I really like peanuts. And I ate, I think, half a kilo of peanuts, maybe even more. <laughs> and uh, of course, my mother wanted to kill me and my uncle. Uh, and afterwards, of course, I puked a lot. And it, I, I think I was six or seven years old. I didn't eat peanuts until faculty. <laughs> Still today, when somebody gives me peanuts, I take five or six pieces, and afterwards my stomach starts working kind of, ah, don't do it. It's even when you smell it. Why? Just imagine you eat something broken, and you feel so bad that your mind says, ja, just leave it. You, you wouldn't survive, right? So our data show that suppression, we don't know does it exist in some complex ideas, but so far all that we know from the real data is actually that suppression doesn't exist. It, it, it appears in the opposite manner. There is something which is probably not from psychology, but maybe it came to your mind from everyday life. When you feel really angry, you say, I want to break something, and it makes me feel easier. There is actually the whole movement in psychology about that. It's called destructotherapy. Uh, the idea actually came from uh, different uh, happenings when people were kind of uh, swallowing <coughs> the anger inside of themselves, and then they break. There are many events of, of that kind. Uh, like in 1986, uh, this person actually killed a lot of his own colleagues in the post. And after this happening, there is a saying going postal. It means kind of a losing yourself. Uh, there is a, when I was giving this lecture, uh, one guy from the audience says, you can translate it into our languages, poštašaviti, which can, can be kind of a felt like that. So what was the idea? If you're kind of a feeling stressed a lot, you just kind of a, expose it, just, just release it, maybe you'll feel better. And 
this is the idea. Actually, what you can do, you can go to uh, team building, which actually happened. This is a photograph from one IT company. Uh, I don't know the people, it's from the United States, but they put, people put it a lot. So they organize weekends for their employees. These are several nice ladies from IT sector. So there are actually rooms like this with a lot of furniture. They give you some kind of, a, a, I don't know, to protect yourself, a lot of suits, and they give you hammers and uh, whatever you like, and you go inside and you break everything. <laughs> there, there, there was an app, for the computer, not an app, but four apps. Ah, with the computer. hammer. You can... Yeah, the way on the computer, I had that on my desktop, and like smashing stuff. Yeah, just a kind of, yeah, like a screensaver. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can go and break the computer. A baseball or a hammer yeah. or whatever you want. And it still happens. Uh, it's like some 30 or 40 years people are doing it, really. So they just rent a room and send their employees and go just express yourself. And they break everything and say, go back on work on Monday. But what actually data show, these effects are really short, short term. So people won't get much better. What actually shows is that it can be useful, but only if it's followed by constructive problem solving. Meaning that if you're feeling uh, angry or you have a lot of problems at work, nothing won't help if you go and break a room. It will just make you tired. And for a really, really short time after that, maybe a few hours, you will feel kind of, oh, I'm relaxed. But after a day or even a few hours later, the problems will come back and it doesn't actually solve anything. So this is, this is one of the things which actually is widely used today, but it's not shown to have any huge effect. It has just this short term, but people still believe it. One of the popular myths is uh, also that the people are afraid of madness, of insanity. Uh, there are data showing that 80% of Americans believe that psychiatric clients are violent. Why does this happen? There is something in psychology of thinking, cognitive psychology, which is called availability heuristic. <coughs> and I will ask you a short question. Who makes more movies, Poland or France? Did you ever read something about movie industry or whatever, did you know? But you just have the feeling that somebody makes more movies, right? Yes. Based on what do you give this judgment? Based on the movies which are more available to you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if I would say who makes more movies, uh, United States or India, if you're not aware of the Bollywood, you would probably say United States, but India is having a huge industry of movies, but it, for the most of the people, it's not familiar with it. It's not available. So the information which are more available to us, we kind of say that they appear more frequently. So uh, when you look at the movies, psychiatric clients are often shown in movies as violent persons, available, doing all lots of horror stuff. Uh, in media, when somebody does a crime or kills somebody, almost first or second question of the reporter was, is he a psychiatric client? Which normally doesn't have to do anything with the, with the crime, but that's kind of a first idea with what comes to your mind. The only two problematic behaviors or mental illnesses which have something to do with the violence is paranoia. You know, the, the beliefs that somebody is following you and so on. And the addiction, alcohol and drug abuse. That's the only two. All other disorders have nothing to do with uh, violence. Actually, 90% of psychiatric clients have never, but never <laughs> committed violence, which is a huge bias in comparison to the regular population. Yeah. Uh, is there any uh, relevance with the character of the psych uh, psychiatric clients? Uh, because I have uh, seen some cases, because I went to the medical school and we had some sort of practice at psychiatric uh -huh. center, 
And uh, there was one uh, patient that had, uh, I think it was bipolar uh, uh -huh. disorder. And uh, every time he went to that uh, Maria. euphoria, yeah. and, uh, uh, that kind of state, uh, he was actually quite, um, uh, he wanted to fight even he, when he was drinking drugs and uh, he was normal to say. Yeah. And, uh, but his character, I think, he made him even worse in that state of mind. So yeah. I'm asking you, is there any relevance to the character or...? Yeah, that's the idea. The, the character, personality characteristics are actually much more uh, relevant for, for that than his psychiatric state. Because he's like one of these 10%. Uh, the, the, the only thing is that they, I can tell you that in a regular population, uh, committing like violent acts goes up to 40 or 50 percent. But here we have only 10. What actually happens is that they are more often victims. They are the ones who are victimized and performing. But we still, a lot of people are afraid of, uh, of psychiatric clients uh, because of their representation in movies. Like, if somebody performs a crime and he had some uh, history of mental illness, you will find uh, the title in the newspaper, psychiatric client killed someone. Although the fact that he's a like, psychiatric client doesn't have anything to do. Even today, like, you can see that, that this availability heuristic making a lot of uh, problems for, for public opinion is that when the, when the migrants, when perform some kind of a, uh, violence, uh, they rob somebody or rape somebody, you will see a title in the, in the newspapers, migrants or raped this one. Although uh, raping happens more often with the domicile, with domestic population than with migrants, but even if one case happens, then you will see a title, migrant performed this. Although it has nothing to do with the fact that he's a migrant, he's just a violent guy, right? But uh, that's kind of what papers pop out, and they're totally unaware that this spreads the idea that all migrants are behaving like that. It's the same what happens with the, with the madness or with the illness, psychiatric illness. And one of the things which also makes <coughs> us be afraid of the mental illness is that they are unpredictable. <laughs> so, are you afraid? <laughs> so, why are you afraid of me now? Because you probably didn't expect that I will do that. Right? It doesn't happen quite often that you are at the lecture at the seaside and somebody says, wow, well said. And just imagine, like you say, this bipolar affective disorder, those people are changing their moods from time to time, quite often. And it's not kind of a, something that you can predict how will they behave. When somebody is unpredictably, unpredictably behaving, it, it's hard for you to, to accommodate, and then it often causes fear. But the fact is that there is this myth that mentally ill people are dangerous. The facts show that they are not. At least they are less dangerous than, than those who are not mentally ill. This is something which you probably heard with the anti-vaccination movement. Uh, does it happen that people are more autistic today or not? What is autism? It's a disorder of development, which is characterized by impaired interactions and communication and some stereotypical behaviors. Stereotypical behaviors are like rocking is one of the most often. You often see those kids standing and sh shaking like this. This is like one of the typical behaviors. Uh, why did this idea appear? By the 1990, the prevalence was one in two and a half thousand. But in 2007, it appeared that one in every 150 or even one in 70 has autism. This kind of says that, okay, if one in two and a half thousand, 17 years later, one in every 150 has it, what is going on? Is autism spreading? How? And this actually then nicely collapsed with anti-vaccination and with, what actually happened? Good idea, but something even worse happened. You, you, if you see in The Rain Man, this is the, the movie about the autistic adult person. It's also a nice movie, I recommend it. Diagnostic criteria changed. 
So, like in psychiatry, we have in, uh, in Europe and Asia, we use ICD-10 or 11, which is international classification of diseases. In America, they use DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And these manuals change in every five or 10 or 20 years. So somewhere around 2000, these criteria changed, lowered. What does it mean? It was easier to diagnose autism after 2000 than before that. England, what he actually did, he used same criteria, the old criteria for new cases, and what he showed, the prevalence, of course, doesn't change. So when you apply the same measure, it actually turns out there is no flood of autism. There is no pandemic of autism. The only thing was that our measure of autism changed. We kind of uh, started using different criteria. And this is one of the things how people badly communicated this data with the public. It appears that like something is spreading. What about the werewolves? Of course, you're aware of that they don't exist or do. I'm not going to talk about the werewolves from, from movies. I'm going to talk about the effect which actually a lot of people believe still. Uh, uh, one of my cousins worked in uh, Switzerland in psychiatric hospital. And up to 1990, up to 25, 30 years ago, when the full moon appears, they were tithing psychiatric patients for the best. Because what they say, well, although we know that around every 30 days, some astronomical event happens, which is trivial, which is when the moon goes, right? Are there any psychological consequences? Would it have? Is there some increase in psychiatric cases or so? Of course, from that, point the word lunatic appears. Luna is the moon. And that's why we are using lunatic as a bad word for the mental illness. It's also called, called lunar effect, Transylvania effect sometimes. And actually, it's not scary when you know, okay, some people believe it, but 80% of professionals believe it. Medical doctors, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, not only did you see, okay, some uh, not so educated uh, surroundings, no, in hospitals. My cousin works in Switzerland, which is like a famous hospital. And he says, you know, when, when the older psych psychiatrists were retired, then we actually stopped tying people for the bed during the full moon. They believed until 1995 or so that this should happen. Also, what you can hear with the doctors, they say, well, I don't believe it, but it's safer to tie them just in case. Nothing happens. And this is actually a methodological policy. 70% of, of technical staff believes in it. And then this guy came along with spreading the idea, saying, OK, let's think about it. The body has four-fifths of water inside, the moon, when it's a full moon. Nobody is actually telling it. You know, when it's a full moon, and when it's not a full, it's the same moon, you just don't see part of it. <laughs> the fact that you don't see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? But nevertheless, they say, okay, and then what then? Water, something, it has to do. No, it doesn't. But this is kind of a, a lot of, uh, this spread, spread the idea that kind of gave us explanation possible what might happen. Of course, studies show that during the full moon nothing happens. There was even one study found that during the full moon, they showed that there are some increase in car accidents. And people started explaining, wow, does it have something to do with the light or so? But then somebody found an error in their study. What happened in the period when they were collecting data, it appeared accidentally that the full moon was during weekends. And during weekends, people drink more and drive more and have more accidents. When they were controlling for whether it's a weekend or not, of course, nothing appeared. There were actually a lot of studies showing that during the full moon, you don't have anything. 
There is no increase in murders, crimes, suicide, suicide, psychiatric problems. Even there are no more calls to the crisis centers. Why is it important? Because people believe that this has an effect. And you might say because people believe they will fear more and they will call for help, but it doesn't happen. What is the methodological policy behind this? It's a typical fallacy showing that you have, of course, four possible situations simplified. When somebody goes to the hospital, during the full moon, everybody notices. But nobody notices people going to hospitals when it's not the full moon. Nobody notices how many people don't go to the hospital during the full moon or not. So in order to have the full effect, you would need to compare all these four situations. We never compare them. We always compare this one. And this bias is very, really often related to many beliefs in like, uh, uh, like just imagine how superstitious goes on. Like uh, a few days ago, I was watching a movie between uh, Bjorn Borg and uh, John McEnroe, the famous tennis player. And they were saying Bjorn Borg was a lot of, uh, having a lot of superstitious movements, like wearing the same socks. When, you know, Rafael Nadal in these days is always like fixing and uh, doing. So why do they believe it? Just imagine, you go out, you wear your famous socks, and you pass the exam. Give it professor there. And then you say, next exam, well, it doesn't cost anything to wear the same socks. And then you pass again. You say, whoa, this works. No, you just don't follow the other situations, right? But you don't have time to follow them. Change socks, who, who will it? You just, this kind of a bias is quite oftenly happening. Is this uh, OK for now? Not yes. too many information. I'm just guiding you to, to a lot of myths. You will probably forget most of them. But you will remember that most of them are myths. If, if you know about Neil Gaiman, you'll know about Sandman, or at least if you know Metallica. Uh, what is actually one of the popular ideas in psychology, in many psychologists also believe it, do dreams have some kind of a meaning? Half of the American population believes it. In, I'm just giving you the states for which we have data. Between half and three-thirds of the people believe that the dreams contain hidden truths. The same as we believed for hypnosis. If it can help us with something, people also believe uh, dreams are an interesting phenomenon. But actually, what we know, there are no scientific data about it. It's almost impossible to investigate the contents of the dream. <coughs> the only way how can we know what people are dreaming about is what they tell us. But when you wake up, it's hard for you to remember some things because your memory is changing. But just imagine how hard it is to remember your dreams, which are almost unconscious that they are happening. The only thing we know is there is this rapid eye movement, REM phase, and it's important for our fun functioning. The only thing that we know for sure from now on is that when you fall asleep after an hour, an hour and a half, if you're not tired, your brain goes into some weird motion of the eyes and your whole body is kind of, there are brain waves which are changing. So the brain activity is changing. And the only explanation for this that we have, and we are quite sure about it, is that your brain is during dreaming performing something like defragmentation of the disk. You know when your computer is full of chunk, you go and say defragment disk. It was in the old computers, today's computers doing it by themselves. So what actually happens is that during the day you collect a lot of a lot of junk. Just imagine what you heard today. Uh, what was for the breakfast, what were the stories? You had an hour of lecture of psychological bullshit. And then you go to sleep, and what your brain does is say, okay, let's see, this is junk, delete. This is real junk, shift delete. <laughs> and while he's doing it, it would be hard for you to function if you would fill in the brain with all the information. So just imagine what are the dreams 
Just imagine that there is a group of people in your brain. When you fall asleep, they do a rewinding of the tape and deleting and uh, gluing the parts of the tape. And th those bizarre things which happen in the dream. You're dreaming your friend and it suddenly turns into a whale <laughs> and starts swimming. What happened? You're just somebody collapsed two parts of the film and deleted the middle part. Just remember the excursions during the high school. When you don't, when you don't sleep or dream for a day or two, and somebody asks you later on, what's your name? And you say, um, uh, <laughs> what happens? You didn't sleep. There was no this cleaning guys, cleaning your junk, and your brain is full of junk, and it cannot function. Just imagine that you put a lot of junk in your room every day and don't clean it. After five days, you won't be able to open the door. Do dreams have meanings? We, we just don't know. It's impossible. This is the only thing that we know for sure. Another thing which appeared as interesting is something that we call Mozart effect. Do we get smarter by listening to Mozart? Actually, this has a scientific study behind it. Uh, in 1993, this is published, I think, in Nature. After 10 seconds of listening to Mozart, people, students, were better in some reasoning tasks. And this is the effect. The effects are short term. What does it mean? When you listen a little bit of pleasant music, next 10 or 15 music, minutes you are relaxed, and you, of course, you have better attention, but it, it disappears. But then somebody in the newspapers calls it Mozart effect. Now, these days, when we are surviving this corona pandemic, somebody is telling you we are living new normality. By giving names to some phenomena, we kind of raise importance. When they ask you what is new normality, it's normality, right? <laughs> With masks, but it's normality. Even they will disappear someday. But when you call this effect, then people say, wow, this is the Mozart effect. I remember when these reality shows start appearing in our media, a lot of, some psychologists uh, say for one of the participants that she has the Cinderella syndrome. You can imagine the number of the news, people from newspapers and TV calling us saying, what is Cinderella syndrome? We were saying, we don't have the idea, it doesn't exist. But somebody calls it syndrome and so on. Millions of CDs in Georgia and United States were sold because the government of Georgia ordered that every newborn kid has to be given with a CD of Mozart. <laughs> and here was the elections. This effect was never replicated. Even this short-term effect. The author of this study she says that she spent next 10 years regretting that she did it. And she was always saying, people, I never said that Mozart makes you smarter. I only said that short-term arousal gives short-term effects with anything, not just Mozart. Cup of coffee will do the same job. By accident, she took Mozart because she likes it. And this caused, even today, a lot of people believe in this. It's not, this is just an scientific information which is real, which is just badly communicated. Do you have strength for three or four more? Yes. Yes? yes. Sure? Because now even the hard, harder stuff. <laughs> there is one thing which sociology people like a lot. It's called alienations. We are becoming strangers to each other in big cities. One of the events which actually started this story was the story about this lady. <clears throat> this is the title from the newspaper. 37 people saw murder and didn't call the police. 1964 from the New York Times. She was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. And this is the title from the New York Times. Her name was Kitty Genovese. And what actually happened that when she was murdered, there was a police strike. Four people did report the first attack. 
She wasn't killed in front of the 37 people. She was murdered during the night when nobody saw. I don't know where this number 37 came from. It was an IDX murder. My mom wants to watch it. My wants to do it her. They actually uh, take the same location and show at the buildings how many windows were lit. Uh -huh. During the just to show how many people saw the murder, no matter they don't know if they were walking through the yeah, theater yeah. or not. The yeah, they were kind of showing the possibility yeah. to. Uh, this was this. this is, you will find this in any textbook of social psychology. But it's a, totally wrong. There, there was a Stephen Levitt, a Stephen Dubner, economist and a journalist who wrote a nice book called Freakonomics. They are actually investigating what happened and what actually did when the newspaper, people from the newspaper journalists went to the police, police didn't want to say that they were on a strike. They say, oh, leave the strike alone, but somebody killed a lady, nobody called us. And this nobody said 37. <laughs> somebody probably popped the number. And uh, this is something with 50 years we are learning about, and it actually didn't happen. It happened in a totally different manner. But there is something which is true, which is called shared responsibility. And what is shared responsibility? Where you're on the street, and you see something happens, and there are many people in this room, you will probably think somebody else will react. And this shared responsibility, I remember, uh, like when the electricity goes down in my village, say, will I call the distribution? I said, somebody will call it. There is somebody in charge. And my friends who work there says, please call us sometimes, but sometimes we are not aware whether half of the state has electricity or not, because we cannot follow it all the time. So this is the true effect. This is, of course, something that just doesn't happen. <clears throat> One myth which is a dangerous thing, is related to psychological testing. This is the myth, because even psychologists interpret tests in a bad manner. They don't interpret it as they're supposed to. What does it mean? This guy actually, in 1930s, formed theory of psychological testing, showing us what psychological tests can do and what they cannot do. The only thing which you can measure with test, with questionnaire, is the position of somebody in relation to the group. What is IQ, for example? IQ doesn't show you how smart are you. It's impossible. I cannot take a meter and go inside your head and say, oops, this is her. The only thing what I can do is compare you to, to other people from some reference group. And this is where statistics becomes important. I have to mention it at least a little. So based on normal distribution, or some mathematical models that we have, we have expectations of the percentages of people in the population for various characteristics. And according to everything we know about living beings, we expect that for their characteristics, most of them to be normally distributed. What does it mean? When you have average IQ, it means that you're on the middle. What does it mean on the middle? It means that you are better from 50% and worse from 50%. If you have IQ on standardized tests around 115, you're here. With the IQ on 115, you're better from 84% of people. If you have IQ of 130, you will be better than 97.6%. It means if you have IQ of 130, you're among 2.5% of the smartest people <coughs> in a certain population. That's why what, what do you do when you have tests? You have points, and you have standardization sample. You have norms. And then you compare your result to the norm. Why is this important? It's important to know that if you did a test in one country and went to another country and did a test, you, it's hard to compare those two results. Uh, there, there was a, like a 
journal article about it in a popular media about comparison between nations. There, there's this guy in, uh, I think he's British, uh, and he showed like these nations are smarter, these are less. This is totally uh, uncomparable. In order to compare it, you will need to have the same test standardized in the whole world. Because even if it's a similar or same test, but if you're using different norms, you're using different meters, different measures. And it's impossible to compare it before you do it. And that, that's why we sometimes have these bad in interpretations, because many people don't understand it. I cannot measure how smart somebody is. I can only measure is he smarter or less smart than 50, 60% of standardization sample of his group. It's even sometimes hard on some tests to compare IQs of young people with the IQs of old people because norms are different. So norms are sometimes separately made for, for, for young and for the old. One of the things, one of the myths that even I contributed to together with Tiana is something which is widely believed that our senses are cheating us. Because when you go to the, <laughs> yeah, I see you recognize psychology. When you go to the internet, and when you go to science festival which you organize, what is the most interesting thing? I'm doing perception psychology. What is the most interesting thing to show to people? It's errors called illusions. And then people go and says, wow, it's just an illusion. <laughs> Everything is an illusion, right? No, it's not. This is the, one of the famous examples appearing a few years. How, how is it colored? Blue. Blue? Blue. 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 Who is in the crowd with the white and, uh, and gold? Please, there are more. Probably they are shy. And most of you are blue and black, right? Oh, you are a bizarre sample. It's usually the other way around. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a white and gold, but I can switch to the black. Yes, I can switch to but... Did you hear two of them? We can change. Oh. Everybody yeah. can change. Because this dress, it's neither. It's neither white and gold. It's neither blue and, <coughs> and green. This one is in the middle. This is true blue and black. This is true white and yellow, right? No. You all see this white and gold. No. You all no. see this. No, I can see blue and here? Yeah, yes. Blue. 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 This is really strange when, when somebody, because it's probably rare, I don't know why, but mo almost nobody sees here on this. But now look at this one. You can clearly see that it sits somewhere in the middle. For some people, probably for you and me, this one is closer to this one, but it's obvious that it's a bit different. For some of the people, this one looks closer to this one, but it's obvious it's not the same. So, what is this picture showing you? It's showing your brain something in the middle, and your brain needs to decide. And then what Tihana says, in some conditions, it's obvious that you can switch. It's called bistable simulation, which is somewhere on the border. And your, your brain doesn't like to be undecisive. You know? he, he likes to decide. Is it this table? Oh, it's this one. He just accidentally pops something out. When, when one option pops out, it's hard to switch, then it takes special. Just to show that it's not a worldwide phenomena, this is a kitchen uh, and the dining room in Petnica in Valjevo. And the same day when this dress appeared, we went for lunch in Petnica, and the ladies who work there make these fine cakes. You probably know where I'm getting it. This cake and this cake is the same. I even have a video I can show it to you later on by taking this cake and bringing it down, it turns yellow, and then I'm bringing it up, it turns black. Why? This one is in the shadow, this one is under the full light. Your brain knows that this image can be made if you take a photo of this dress under the full yellow light, or if you take a photo of this dress under the full blue light. What did you do? Your brain doesn't know. And he just says, oh, it doesn't matter. It's this one. But once when he decides, it's hard to change. Actually, these
these are quite rare situations. Our brain is usually not fooling on us. The most important question for us as people who do research on this topic is why and when do our senses cheat on us? It's mostly in conditions for which they, they are not adapted. Most of the illusions you won't find in nature. They are appeared in computer screens or in, in laboratories. In nature, our eyes work quite well. And the last two or three myths, one really, really popular one is the called 25th frame. Somewhere in the 60s and 70s, the idea appeared that if I have a subliminal message, what's a subliminal message? It's something that you consciously cannot uh, perceive. This was the, the time frame which was used. Can it change how we think or believe? It's one of the myths which says, ah, somebody believed that this can have an effect, and people were already starting talking that it does have an effect, but actually the true research show that there is no effect. These subliminal messages actually show that people don't change their behaviors, their beliefs. Even in commercials, they don't use it. There was one attempt in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in TV. They really played some liminal message in 58. There's something called Sunday Night Show. They, they blinked 352 times, phone now, call us now, call us now. You know what happened? Nothing, yeah. There was no change. But even today, in many conspiracy theories, we have this idea, oh, look at Walt Disney. Lucifer, 666. Six, six. Somebody is saying the cat name is Lucifer. <laughs> when you look at you, oh, look what you see in the Winnie the Pooh, and so on and so on. Actually, these all ideas are coming from these subliminal effects. There was even a, a, a cue of rock and roll songs, and when you play the background, backwards, that is here, I worship thou. We tried it. You can all try it. They could sell us this story in the 60s when it was hard to try it. Today you can just play it in any player in reverse. Nothing is, can be heard. There was no change in the number of calls. But just I want to make you feel how important these badly communicated messages are, if, although if they are errors. Even studies show that there is no effect. Even these people in the TV showed it doesn't have the effect. In the 2000, in political campaign, Republicans in the presidential election campaign in which, uh, you know, what, what happened, the, the, the Alan Gore was the, the country candidate and the Bush won. When the Al Gore appeared, they played the word rats. So in the Fox News, when they, there's an Alan Gore, there's rats, rats, <laughs> subliminally. And of course, since Bush won, they say, woo, it works. No, it doesn't work. It's the, the selection bias, right? Like with the, with the, the full moon. The of the Fox. Yeah. But they are definitely not Al Gore voters. <laughs> yeah. The, who watches Fox won't, won't believe in the rest. But you can see how important this is. Because people, they pay money for it in political campaigns in the 21st century. Although it's shown that it doesn't have it. And now we go to neuroscience with two more things. So from, we started from parapsychology, going to psychology, and then we finish with the brain. One of the most popular myths is that we have left and right brain. Do we have like a left and right half of the brain? Yes, we do. Are they different? Well, actually, no. So you can find images like this on the internet. This one is creative. This is analytical part. Uh, it's really artistically shown, but what we know is there are various zones, parts of the brains, which are performing different functions. For instance, in most of the people, language is based here and here. Wernicke and Broca zone. Uh, that's one example. But some functions like language are lateralized. It means go on one side. But many of the functions are bilateral, performed by both sides. For instance, vision. When you look, it goes here. There are parts of the brain uh, kind of analyzing the images, and they are all over the brain. 
Most of the functions are all over the brain. Even those who are lateralized, like when the baby is born and there is a damage to the left part of the brain, this baby will develop language because the functions will go to the right. It, it's not so different. And there is this sentence, which is nice, uh, by Scott Lillenfeld. He says, two hemispheres are much more similar than different. Same as when, when you go for the gender effects. Are males from Mars and females from Venus? Are we different species? Of course not. Because if we would be different species, we wouldn't be able to have kids, right? Actually, are there some gender differences? Well, yeah, from time to time. But two genders are much more similar. We are part of the same species than different from each other. But when people talk, they always talk about the differences. Then it seems like that we are different. It's the same with the left and the right part of the brain. And finally, to finish with the title, we started with Popeye and let's finish with Lucy. How to heck did we come with the idea that we only use 10% of our brain? When I was in primary school, one of my teachers, in, one of our teachers in school also told us, no, 10% is too much. You use 2%. Tesla, he was using six. <laughs> and we were like, wow, how did he calculate that? In the same way as those journalists calculated 37 people didn't call nobody. They, 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 they just, you know, even. How did this story start? Somewhere in the 19th century, when physiology started to appear, People who were just starting to examine the brain with the ways that they could, so they kind of said that in the beginning of the 20th century, part of this brain for whom we don't know what works, well, they say it's inactive. It was kind of a, we don't know for the 90% of the brain what does it work because they didn't have fMRI, EEG, and so on. And they were kind of prone. Uh, one of the guys who was uh, actually godfather of this idea was a famous philosopher, William James. And I believe this was a joke, which he did. He says, the average person rarely use more than 10% of the brain, which is a philosopher's joke. But somebody put it in a journal or somewhere, a famous philosopher said, so please be careful when you say to the journal or something, you might end up with 150 years of kids needed to eat spinach because of you. <laughs> because you said something, ha ha, it's a funny thing. Be careful with journalists. Of course, we use 100% of the brain. It would be a huge error of the nature if you use 10% and the brain is really expensive organ. The brain spends around one-fifth of the energy. It's really expensive. Just imagine the idiotic nature who would provide us with an organ who spends one-fifth of the energy, and she says, you can use only 10% of this. Just imagine you pay 2,000 euros for a computer, and you use only 10% for video games. Yeah, you, you, you do it sometimes. <laughs> But it's not happened with the nature. Some parts, actually, of the works are something that we are aware of. But a lot of parts of the brain are continuously working. We're just not aware of it. There are a lot of functions which are hidden from us. Nature hid, hid it from us. Why, did, why, why are they hidden? Because it would be an awful mistake that we need to think about them. Just imagine that you need to think how you breathe. And you go to sleep, and you forget that you should breathe. <laughs> it's like, breathing needs to be hidden from you. Even today, this is used. This is the advertisement for one airline company. It says, it's been said that we use only 10% of our brain. However, if you're flying with us, you're using considerably more. This is the advertisement, I think it's an Australian company, which is still used today. Six or ten years ago, we had the movie Lucy about. It's, it's really, really something which is popped up. And I will finish with this. How 
did these meat appear and how the heck did they survive for century, century and a half? They replicate fast. They replicate yeah. fast with everything. Most of them happen in oral communication. Oral communication is nice. You, you're kind of familiar with it. Uh, we go to pubs and we communicate science, which is good. But people remember what they want to remember. Information that we spread to others can be very different. You don't know how somebody will understand it. If you as a philosopher say, average people use is only 10% of the brain, somebody will say, wow, this is scientific evidence. <laughs> Many people desire for quick solutions. How we will deal with coronavirus? Instead of saying, we have no idea, it's a new thing. I mean, people like solutions, they want it. And then somebody says, oh, do this, do this, do this, do this. After five days, they need to change information. But what they said first goes in the audience. People often get selected data, sorry. People often don't get real data, like with, uh, with the full moon, we only get part of the picture. This is very dangerous thing mm -hmm. because sometimes we see relations in the nature which only showing that some people appear in the same time, some things appear in the same time. It doesn't necessarily mean that something causes the other one. And unfortunately, we are prone to interpret correlations as causality. It's a it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a statistical and methodological fallacy. Just, just to give you the example of correlation and causality, there are bizarre relations. Like, you have this on the internet, you can find meaningless correlations. There is a, like, a huge relation between the number of films which Nicolas Cage makes and number of people who drowned in the swimming pool. The more films Nicolas Cage appears in, the more people drown. Just imagine somebody saying, please, Mr. Cage, don't make more movies. People will drown. Of course, it's not causality. It's just uh, some weird relation. Who knows how it appears? There are conclusions based on this which appear from nowhere. People just say, OK, this has to be the reason. There are a lot of samples which are not representative. People often say, OK, does homeopathy work? Yeah, I know my neighbor who went to homeopath and it helped him. But who knows what helped his uh, neighbor? Maybe he's drinking medications besides homeopath. There is something which is called heuristic or representativeness. It's the, when you're judging the book by its cover, the first thing that you see, you say, oh, this has to be it, although it doesn't. Of course, media make a lot of problems in exaggerating these uh, things that we found. Many of the myths that I show you are actually based on some existing things, but media just made the things pop up. Like, we know that there is a shared responsibility. People, when they are in group, they don't feel to react because somebody else will do it. But media found a way to say that we are becoming strangers to each other, and they call it alienation. It often happens that we exaggerate existing effects. Some effects can be really, really small, but then people talk about it like it's gravity. And of course, there is a huge terminological confusion because people are often prone to literal translations. There is a one, one of my favorite uh, errors in translation. Uh, you know that it says every, every rule has an exception. That's the true translation. We usually say an exception confirms the rule, which is actually a consequence of the wrong translation. So I think this translation error is lasting for 2,000 years and so It can be even worse than this. Because why? Somebody just made an error saying that an uh, like outlier confirms the rule. And we are still quoting it, although the true translation is like every rule has outliers or outer. And I will leave you with the famous magician and say that you should communicate science. With that. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, 
if there are any uh, questions or comments, uh, please. I only have one question. How do you deal with the media that are trying to exaggerate information from you? And how, how do you respond to that? To oh. them? Okay, yeah, that's the, that's a good point. Actually, we talked uh, with, with Tiana that we can uh, discuss a little bit more about this. How, how, how should you react? Uh, the things that I showed you are myths in comparison with facts. Now, unfortunately, I cannot reply to you with facts because now we are entering the zone which is kind of more um, with recommendations what you should not do. You should not uh, behave as a, um, if you are aware of that, that the journalists like to exaggerate. And the many people will judge the book based on its cover. Don't start with the opening sentence saying, I found the Mozart effect. You should be careful. You should nice, make a nice balance because the, the first thing is that you should be interesting at the start, that the people would follow you. But be careful that you don't exaggerate yourself because that's the first thing that the people will remember. Just can make interesting, but carefully interesting thing now. Be careful not to, to give names to non-existing phenomena. People will easily remember it, but they will pr be prone to, uh, to exaggerate it. And also, one of the things is that, uh, especially when you're arguing with the people who are not on your side, that's uh, what we talked about in our group a little bit, uh, like if you are invited on TV and you should explain to people that there is no pandemic of autism or that the earth is not flat, one of the basic errors what the scientists do, there are, I, I would say, two basic. It's my opinion. Like one basic, he says, oh, any fool believes it. When you're saying that the people who believe it are fools, you lost them. Just imagine me coming to the lecture and says, what, you're a physicist? Ah, <laughs> suckers. <laughs> <laughs> Would you listen to me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I, kind of, I started my lecture, oh, there is an unreturned love of psychology towards physics. <laughs> <laughs> you need to receive the audience for yourself. Of course, you shouldn't say to you, oh, you believe that the earth is flat too. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> But you might say something like, there is an important issue, which is uh, still lasting. Many people, unfortunately, believe. But we believe, let's discuss, and so on. You should give people a chance not to feel themselves as stupid, and also to give them a chance to, to kind of discover your arguments by themselves. That turns out to be the best solution. When you give the chance to people to understand you, and the kind of a have the feeling that themselves discovered this is that the earth is wrong. Yeah, but, but I, have, I have a problem with the media. Not, not uh, like I have really big problems, but I have uh, one situation that I had uh, when we talked about light pollution in Serbia. No one talks about that in Serbia. But uh, one, uh, the Trova, I think, uh, they invited us into the morning uh, session for like five minutes in the air, which was. For us, that was a big deal because it is, it is a national TV and maybe most watched in yeah. Serbia. And she asked us to come, and when we came there for those five minutes in Belgrade, <laughs> she told us, okay, I will start with uh, Belgrade shines 18 times brighter than New York City. And we, and, uh, we were like, no, we, we didn't want to say that. That's, uh, she just uh, misread the satellite data. Yeah. Actually, they compared the darkest part of New York with the brightest part of New York, <laughs> which is... Uh, and she was like, no, but I need something to, you know, for clickbait. And we were like, but don't use that. I have problem with that. And she was like, no, don't worry, don't worry. The important thing is for them to read it. And we were like, we are not accepting that. Uh, I asking you about the journalists, maybe more than the public, because they are pushy, but it is important to communicate with them, because it was really a one-time chance for us in that yeah, year without experience. Those, those situations ask a lot of diplomacy from your side. Yeah, you, you can lose her too, Yeah, yeah. or you can start uh, 
by kind of saying, can you at least please ask us, is it true that Belgrade shine? <laughs> you can kind of go, go in the middle because, yeah, it's sometimes hard, but we as a scientist need to accept that sometimes we will just go, go into the journalist who doesn't care about us and he will say, do whatever he does. So we just kind of have to accept that sometimes we, we won't work. Yeah. Well, she decided to talk about the, her love of stars instead of it. So uh, it's, <laughs> I think more fine than. Yeah, it's somewhere in, in yeah. the middle. <laughs> you wanted to? Yes, I have one question about is it true what you say about video games and their impact on, on our brains? Yeah. That, uh, Can you consider that as a myth also? That's a, that's a huge, yeah. Uh, most of the things that you find here, there is a book saying 50 most popular myths in psychology. I selected 13 because of the 13. <laughs> I think there are 13. Uh, so there's a 50 myths. I just couldn't tell you about them. One of them is this one, which is based on some true effects. So it's not that myth. So uh, what we know is that uh, involvement, any kind in real life, or in watching movies or in playing games does have some effect. Like many studies show that the kids who play more aggressive games do tend to, in every everyday life, play aggressively with other kids. But what we don't know is it that those kids who are more prone to aggression like to play more games with aggression? You know, what is the direction of causality? That's one of the things which we just don't know so far. And also one of the things that uh, people are pointing out, I like to point it out, many studies show that when you're showing aggressive behavior to kids, I'm just staying with the aggression as one of the topics there, right? When you're showing aggressive behavior to kids, kids will learn aggressive behavior. As when you're showing them whatever. But learning aggressive behavior doesn't mean that the kids will be more aggressive. Because aggression as a, you know, as a, as a, as a state of mind is not the same as aggressive behavior. Because if you have aggressive kids, uh, aggression appears because of the frustration and it's a natural reaction. And there are, there are persons whose character is such they are more prone to aggression and situations can evoke it and so on. When you have those kind of kids and you learn them aggressive behaviors, then you will have more problems. But when you learn most of the kids aggressive behaviors, they won't be aggressive people. They won't go around and killing other people. But what is nasty is that, and we should be careful about it, like when you're learning a kid uh, a lot of movies with aggression and stuff, the, when he gets frustrated, when he gets this natural aggression, the first thing he will do is the first thing he knows, to hit someone. And that, that's, the, that's kind of a, the, the problem. But what actually happens a lot is that people exaggerate this. And they say, oh, if you let your kids do video games like uh, Quake and the stuff, and it kills a lot of zombies, it will kill a lot. It most happen. parents see video games as a problem, but doesn't see the media and the, I don't know, movies as a problem. They just see that. But on the other side, you have some good games, you have sport games, and they put all, they see them all as the same. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's the, yes. that's that's a exaggeration of one effect, and it's just putting like with the illusions. People are talking about the bad stuff. Yeah, of course, there are many studies showing that playing some video games actually develop uh, working memory, working capacity. There are games, uh, simulators, I simulator guess. stuff, so kids kind of think more, process more. So there are, uh, I mean, uh, there are positive effects of video games, of course. But so parents are, doesn't see that most of <laughs> It's uh, most of the things the that parents we, are parents. Parents are parents. People are yeah. people. Yeah. That's. <laughs> I really love, uh, I think that you, uh, somebody showed the, 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 the poster yesterday with the electricity effect when it appeared. It Sasha, Sasha. Sasha. Sasha showed us. Every novelty, but every novelty causes fear. That's the, and especially even before media. Now when we have media, it spreads even more. And when novel things appear, people are afraid because they, you remember, 
it's hard, it's easy to operate from the things that you cannot predict. You don't know what happens. And then people are afraid from novel th things, usually. And when you talk about the bad side, people are always, uh, with electricity, with radio, with TV appearance, uh, with internet when it appears. Everything new that appears now and is 5G. And 3G, and, 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 and many Gs, and many Gs. <laughs> and so uh, every time that something new appears. So that's why the, the video gaming industry is changing and the people are, uh, they are like uh, analysis of developmental psychologists. People are saying like, uh, kids are watching cartoons which are aggressive nowadays from Japan and stuff. But when you look at uh, Bugs Bunny, it, it's an aggressive movie. I mean, uh, Tom, Tom and Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> He's hitting the cat and tearing the cat. And, but nobody asked, hey, you watch the more aggressive movies when you were a kid. Or even the, the tales that we are uh, talking to the kids. You know, the, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it has a lot of aggression. No, I can seven dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> In one way, it's really weird. You know, there is this uh, song for the kids. Push, push, rogo, push, rogo. Ako nechis pusti ti, ja ću tebe ubiti. It was just singing to the kids. And you don't wonder, is it aggressive? But you wonder, is it aggressive? But it's a voice. Yeah. yeah, like with Tom and Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those, those contexts exist for a long time, and uh, I would say that video game is just one novelty from which people are afraid more than they used to. And uh, yeah, this is the good thing when, uh, unfortunately, when psychologists go out on TV, they often point out the negative sides. Yes. And I think it's, it, they, they are actually doing the wrong uh, TV uh, presence. They, they, they should point out the good sides too. And it's, it's good to, to kind of uh, say to people, internet safety, it's important issue. But don't just talk about internet safety, talk about positive effects of internet and stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> you are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Super. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 it has a very low